after uh, Pentecost. We'll be back here in, in somewhere in Kent. Not too far from the White Coast of Dover, I guess. Ten miles away. <laughs> Ten miles away. So, a little too close to France, but. And the and the, so in England, and the epistle for this uh, eighth Sunday after Pentecost, taken from St. Paul's to the Romans, chapter eight. Brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you shall die. But if by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. For whosoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again in fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit himself giveth testimony to our spirit, that we are the sons of God, and if sons, heirs also, heirs indeed of God, and joint heirs with Christ. In the Gospel, according to St. Luke, taking that according to St. Luke, chapter 16. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. There was a certain rich man who, was, who had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said to him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for now thou canst be steward no longer. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do, because my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship? To dig I am not able. To beg I am ashamed. I know what I will do, that when I shall be put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Therefore, calling together every one of his Lord's debtors, he said to the first, How much dost thou owe my Lord? But he said, A hundred barrels of oil. And he said to him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly, and write fifty. And then he said to another, How much dost thou owe my Lord? And who said, A hundred quarters of wheat. He said to him, Take thy bill and write eighty. And the Lord commended the unjust steward for as much as he had done wisely. For the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. And I say to you, make unto you friends of the mammon of iniquity, that when you shall fail, they may receive you into everlasting dwellings. And that's by the words of the day's holy gospel. Father, and Holy Ghost, Amen. Today, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Maybe the camera was the wrong one, but right. Today, the the eighth Sunday after after Pentecost, and we have here today also the the consecration of a family, the throne of the family to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And the devotion of the Sacred Heart. Today, a few considerations on devotion. You know that we often have confraternities and organizations. In the last few hundred years, especially, you can join the Third Order Carmelites, you can order the Third Order Dominicans, the Third Order of the Society of St. Pius X, or any other group. And so, what's required to be a member of this Third Order or of this group? In the Carmelites, you say certain devotions. There's a certain prayers you say each day. And they have Carmelite prayers. And then there are the Dominicans, and they have Dominican prayers. And there's the SSPX, Society of Pius X. We have Society of St. Pius X prayers. And we have enthronement to the family of the Sacred Heart today. And we have Sacred Heart prayers. And each day you recite the prayer to the Sacred Heart at the meal or the second heart of Jesus, who renew our pledge, love and loyalty to you. This, and so we say this prayer each day in our families. And so, what is devotion? You know that there are many devotions, all kinds of devotions. Whatever devotions are, we find, find it hard to discover them in the Old Testament. Find it hard to discover them amongst the lives of the saints. All these devotions. Say this prayer, do this thing, and you have devotion. These are devotions, little prayers, but it's not devotion. What is devotion? Devotion comes from two words. 
Day, which means down from or concerning, and voto, concerning a vow. It means concerning a vow. It's something that happens inside of the heart. And in fact, it's something which, in fact, angels can never have. Angels can't have devotion. You know that when God the Son created, and God the Father and the Holy Ghost created man, they said, let us make man unto our own image and likeness. St. Augustine says, you will notice there are two things. He says, make us, make us make, let us make man, which means Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three persons in one God. The Trinity is in the very beginning of sacred scripture. Let us make man according to our own image. Let him be a reflection of us. And this we are like unto the angels. They are a reflection of God's intelligence, a reflection of God's perfections and God's beauty. There's something static in God. There's something unstable about God. We say that God is. In fact, the greatest thing we can say about God is He just is. He never changes. And so this is one aspect of God. He never changes. But when we look inside of God, we see that He has what we call circumincession. What does God do for all eternity? He doesn't move back and forth. He doesn't go up and down. He doesn't go in many, any direction, and yet He's always on the move. God the Father is always regenerating the Son. God the Son <coughs> is always with the Father, and they are breathing forth the Holy Ghost. And God the Holy, the Holy Ghost is returning His divinity to the Father and the Son, so much so that there is no one above the other, no one below the other. They are simply always moving one between the other. This, I, this movement and this movement of the mind of God cannot be reflected in the angels. St. Thomas tells us, an angel, when an angel makes a decision, he makes one decision, he never changes his mind. He makes one decision, and it's perfect. So when St. Michael says, I, and when rather Lucifer says, I will not serve, well, one third of the angels agree with him, and they also said, I will not serve also. We reject God. And in that one rejection, hell is created. In that one rejection, there is all evil. And then Michael said, Who is like unto God? In that one acceptance of God, two-thirds of the angels followed Mikael, and there was one great battle. And in one great battle, which lasted perhaps one second, maybe two at the longest, St. Michael took all the good angels and he went up to the more powerful the Lucifer and he cast him down into hell in one great battle. And then it was finished. But this only shows one part of God. This doesn't show the whole picture. Angels are so much better than us. Angels are so much greater than us. When they make a decision, they don't change their minds. When they make a decision, they know what they're doing. But is this all of God? This is only one aspect of God. God said, let us make man. Angels are more beautiful. Angels are more powerful. Angels are more wonderful. But God loves man. What is it that makes man different? We have minds like unto the angels. And we're supposed to believe an unchanging truth. We have love similar to the angels. We're supposed to love God and never let go. But there's something unstable about us. Something about us that can grow and shrink. We can change our minds. And then when we look at it simply, we say, angels are stable, men are unstable. So angels must be better than man. And that's objectively perhaps true. But according to God, he loves man more. There's something more in us that's not in the angels. For instance, because we don't make one choice, and because we can make many choices, there can be an increase and a multiplication. There can be children. There can be building of churches. There can be a development of the soul. There can be a growth. And what is it that makes all these things happen? It is devotion. Devoto. This power inside of man by which he can say, Yes, I believe in God. Do you believe in God and that's all? I believe in God. I want to follow God. Where is He going? I don't know where He's going. But I believe in Him. And I will follow Him. And what is it that's in the heart of a man that makes him attached to God? 
It drives him to do many things which the angels wonder at. The greatest devotion has ever been had in a human heart in the Old Testament. In fact, one of the greatest devotion that can ever be found is in the heart of one man, and his name is David. David knows devotion. And no one except David knows what devotion is. And if we can have a little bit of his devotion, then we become more men. We become more human. If we have a little bit of his devotion, we become more divine. Because there's something in David that angels envy. Angels watched over David. And this little boy who used to play music. David was governed by his heart. David was going to go out and watch his sheep. When he watched his sheep, he played the harp. And he watched his sheep. And he used to watch them. I remember my, my job as a child, I used to watch goats. Not sheep. Goats. I used to actually go out in the field and sit and watch the goats. And sometimes I would, it was an old green truck. Big, huge truck. It was 1823, whatever it was. It didn't work. It was all rotted out. The big, huge truck, and I remember it was a 1940-something truck. And I used to lay on top of the truck and, and look up into the sky. And I would look in the sky. And then every now and then, the goat's still there. Okay, they're still there. And then I would look up into the sky and look at the sky and look at the sky and watch the clouds move. And I remember after watching the clouds move and not seeing any tree on the right, seeing no tree on the left, after a while, I would begin to fall. I almost fell off the truck three or four times, laying on the truck. Sometimes people are walking by and they see me laying on the truck. Ah! What are you doing? I was looking at the clouds. And the head in the clouds. Looking in the clouds and would begin to fall. I could feel myself fall towards the clouds. And then I would be almost rolled off of the truck because I would lose all sense of anything stable on the earth. I used to go away for that feeling. I'm going to look at the clouds. Watch the clouds move. And then all of a sudden. I would feel like it was falling through the air, falling down, only it was falling up. And several times almost rolled off of the truck. But in any case, and then go look at the goats, and I would scream at the goats, and they would come and follow me. I would yell at the goats, is this time for the food? I would yell at them, and I would sing, I would sing to them also. It wasn't very good singing. But they would all come. They would follow me over to the barn, follow me over to the fence. And then I would yell at them, and talk to them, and watch the goats. And so, what is it? There's something in the heart of a man. David went out, and he watched the sheep. He looked at the clouds, and he went out and watched the sheep, and he sang the harp. He went out and watched the sheep, and he felt a connection between him and the sheep, himself and the sheep. And one day a lion came. And the lion came to eat his sheep. And David attacked the lion as a little bitty boy, a young boy. He attacked the lion, and he was so filled with fire in his heart. He didn't think, lion big, me small, lion killing sheep, he'll eat one, and then I'll live with the others. He simply attacked the sheep. What with the lion? What is it that made a David attack the lion? And he killed the lion. Another day, he took a sheep out of the mouth of a, of a, of a bear. And, this, and he played the harp and played music. And he also had a grandmother and a great-grandmother in sacred scripture, and they must have had a great influence upon him. He listened to them. Rahab was his great-grandmother. Ruth was his, was his grandmother. And he knew about Rahab and he knew about Ruth. Rahab saved all the pe saved the people of Jericho. And he must have wondered about Rahab. What was in the heart of Rahab? She was in a condemned city. But something was in her heart. And she was even a prostitute and living an immoral life. But when three Jewish spies came to her house, she realized, this is my chance. I can choose between these proud soldiers on the walls to protect me, and I can choose between these three fools that need help, that got themselves caught and are about to be captured. I'll save you. I'll hide you in my house. But I'll only hide you on the condition that when you go back to your God, and you go back to your king, you tell them, I know, I Rahab, but I know that all the people of Jericho are going to die. Let them all die. But whoever's in my house... Let him live. And you must vow to me that your God will save those in my house. Something of that heart went into, into David. And then there was Ruth, the grandmother of David. And Ruth had no future. Ruth 
her husband died, she had no children, and she, she said, I will stay with Naomi. And Naomi says, go back to your people. I am a Jewish, and I must go back to my people. Go back to your pagan people. You will never be accepted in my land. You have no future in my land. You can have no children in my land. You can have no life in my land. And when I die, you will be alone. And Ruth said, I know. But thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. And she went, knowing she would never marry. She went, knowing she would die alone. She went, knowing that there was no hope and no future, but her heart was attached to Naomi. It just so happened that God had arranged things otherwise, and she would be the great-grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Boaz would see Ruth and say to his, to his servants, drop a little extra grain. She's going and picking up the grain that the... That that was that is left by the reapers and the so by the reapers. Let the reapers accidentally drop a little more. Don't let her know, but lock, drop a little more so that she will collect enough for her and her mother. And then Boaz married Ruth, and became she became the grandmother of David. David had the heart of Ruth inside of him. David had the heart of Naomi inside of him, and David sang songs perhaps that they had taught him. And David washed the sheep. And David was filled with the heart. This heart is something of God that angels can't have. And this is what devotion is. Devotion is something in the heart by which we vow. And we connect ourselves to someone or something. And we will rather die than lose it. And not only that, we connect to it a little today, a little more tomorrow. A little more and a little more. And we grow and we grow and grow in the connection to that thing that we love. Angels are either all the way perfect or they're all the way bad. But devotion makes us do crazy things. Is devotion, for instance, inside of a little boy? And now I don't, I don't know if you have the dandelions here, but the official flower in America that you give to a mother is a dandelion, which everyone considers to be a weed. But it's yellow and it's available and it's not easy than looking for an actual flower. <laughs> and so what boys will do is they'll grab a dandelion. Say, Mommy, I brought you flowers. <laughs> Which is a weed. But it's different than green, so it must not be a flower. If it's green, it's a weed. If it's not a green, it's a flower. So they bring him the flower. Mommy, I brought you flowers. Mommy says, thank you. Well, she takes the flowers. What is it that makes a boy reach for a dandelion to give to his mother? What is it that makes David attack a lion? What is it that makes him, his, his heart grow in some strength, though he's the weakest and the youngest of seven boys? He's so weak and so young that when Samuel comes to bless the new king, Isaiah says, I've got six sons. And he said, all right, bring them to me. And he brought all the six sons. He says, this, none of these are the, the sons that God wants to bless. Are you sure you don't have any other sons? And Isaiah said, do I have any more sons? Oh, yeah. There's a little bitty weird brat that sings songs to the sheep. <laughs> He's kind of weird. A little bit on the weird side. Where is he? He's out singing songs to the sheep. Well, go get him. Maybe he's the one. And they brought him in. And Samuel said, that's the one. This is the one God wants to be the king of Israel. That's the one. And though he would grow and commit many sins, though he would grow and at one point become exceedingly proud and an enemy of God, and murder Urias. His heart would never really change. And one day when he was an old man, he was visiting near his home because he was raised near the city of Nazareth. Or rather near the city of Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. And he was near Bethlehem. And the Philistines were holding the city of Bethlehem. He was on a hill outside the city. And they had besieged the city. And he looked into the city and he said, Boy, he was an old man very near his death, and he said, Oh, if only I could but taste again of the waters of Bethlehem. And David said those words, If only I could taste again of the waters of Bethlehem. And some soldiers heard the old king say, He wants water from Bethlehem. We love our king, and he wants water from Bethlehem. And the water is behind the enemy lines, and several soldiers fought their way through the lines of the Philistines, and they fought their way to the well of Bethlehem. And they reached into the well, and they put in a flask, and they pulled out water from the well, and they fought their way back. 
A few of them lived. Most died. They came back to David and said, David, we died because we love you. Because you are the greatest of all kings. And we were ready to die because you said you wanted water from Bethlehem. We went and we got it. Here's the water. And David took the flask of water and he poured it into the ground and did not drink a drop. And he said, I am not worthy to drink of the water bought at so great a price. He wasted it. What do great hearts do? Remember our Lord Jesus Christ said, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. What you think is wise, I call foolishness. What you think is foolishness, I call wisdom. He put that heart that made him do what men call foolishness into his saints. He put that heart into them because angels can't get it. Angels don't even comprehend it themselves. What is it that says, one day I will eat, another day I will not? David won another day when, his, when he had the wife of Urias. When Bathsheba was made into his wife and the baby was born and the baby died, he fasted and fasted and fasted that the baby might live. And then when it was discovered the baby had died, he went and he ate. And the serpent said, David, you're crazy. You fasted and you laid in sackcloth that the baby may live. But God said the baby will be killed. Now the baby is dead and now you're feasting. Why are you doing this? What made David eat when he learned that his baby was dead? What made David pour the water out when his soldiers had died to give him water? The answer is he had devotion in his heart. He had a love that an average man can never understand. It says in sacred scripture that the friend is the most rare thing. Most through life will never have one. That's what the scripture tells us. And then our Lord Jesus Christ turned to his apostles. And he said on Holy Thursday night, Yam non dicam vos servos, said amicos. And no longer, longer call you slaves, but friends. How many friends are there of Jesus Christ? They are in fact very few. And what is it that we want whenever we have these devotions? The enthronement of the family of the sacred heart. You can say a few prayers. I remember when we used to say our prayers every day around the table. Dear Sacred Heart of Jesus, to renew our pledge of love and loyalty to you. Get your hands off my potato. <laughs> right, you know. And to keep us always close to love and heart, most guard of thy mother. Hey, shut up. <laughs> and so we said the prayer. We said the prayer. And somehow, it does enter the heart. Because there must come a time when the words enter the heart. But it doesn't happen by just saying the prayer. There's something that has to happen inside the heart. And this takes a great gift of God and a great grace. Saul of Tarsus, even when he was wicked, he had a powerful heart. And he was not satisfied that there be Christians tolerated in the world. That there be Catholics in the world. And he was filled with the fire to destroy them. And he came to destroy them. And God knocked him off his horse. And he made him into St. Paul. He transformed him. And so what is necessary in our times? We need great hearts. We need hearts that have devotion. Hearts that are filled with a fire. St. Paul speaks of it. He says, Caritas Christi urgetnos. The chariot of Christ urges us. The chariot of Christ moves us on. It forces us to keep going forward. There's something inside of me that pushes me, which I have no control over. And this is the true power of divine love inside the soul. The saints are driven. Driven by a power that cannot hold them back. And the trouble we have in, the day to, in our days, no one has this drive. Hearts are now wimpy. Hearts are now weak. Hearts don't strive after great things. Hearts don't hold on tight. One of the great hearts in the Old Testament was Respa. Respa was there at the time of David. And she was uh, in, in, the, in the line of Saul, the wife of one of Saul's children. And Saul had done great sins and killed many of the people. And so David came and said, What punishment should I give to the sons of Saul? And they said, Take seven of them and crucify them. And leave their bodies on a hill. And so he did. He killed them and crucified them and left their bodies on a hill. And Respa came. 
And they were left for th from the beginning of the harvest, when the seed is planted, until the harvest, when the seed is gathered, about four months. She went and she laid sackcloth in front of the crosses. And she stayed there the whole time. During the day, she kept the birds and the vultures from coming down to eat the bodies. At night, she kept the wolves and the animals from coming and eating the bodies. And she stayed 24 hours a day. There were seven days a week during the entirety of those months, until there was the harvest. And finally the word came to David and said, Do you hear of Respa? She is of the house of Saul. She has been there sleeping on sackcloth and sleeping in front of the cross, that the bodies be not damaged. This is what devotion is. Devotion is not to say pious prayers. Devotion is not to have spiritual thoughts from time to time. But during the night she kept away the animals that came by land. During the day, she kept away their birds that came by air, and she protected the bodies of the dead. And she did not stop, and she did not rest. There's something that, that God gave to our hearts, that they can increase, that they can last for a long time, they can prove their devotion by stability. This is done in marriage, by the wife is faithful to the husband, no matter what, no matter how wicked he is. And the husband is faithful to the wife, no matter how wicked she is. And this fidelity makes them saints. And this fidelity transforms the church. This fidelity transforms the world. There's something about fidelity that angels cannot comprehend, since they only make one choice and they can never change their minds. When God created the world, He made it beautiful. But it is as though... He kept finding new ways of making magnificence. There's something spontaneous about the heart of God, which cannot be seen in the angels, but it is seen in man. Hence, St. Augustine says, God created man in his own image and unto his likeness, which is a movement. In image, unto likeness. There's something in man that he has to grow. He has to increase. He has to move in the direction of God. So even the Blessed Virgin Mary, she was conceived without original sin. She was conceived immaculate, and she was the most beautiful baby there has ever been. But imagine you saw Mary as a little baby. Come back and see her when she's five. Come back and see her again when she's 15, and the Holy Ghost overshadows her. Come back and see her again when she's 30. Come back and see her again when she's 45. Come back and see her again right when she is ready to assume into heaven at the age of 64, and you will see she is more beautiful every time. She's more filled with grace every time. She's more magnificent every time. She began perfect and she increased. She began wonderful and she became more wonderful. And this is something angels can't do. What is it that makes us able to do that? It is this notion and mystery of devotion. So, how are we going to get it? Revisit the cross. Revisit the cross. Who notice that Jesus Christ was crucified on Good Friday and 3 p.m. he died. And they all went home. Not all came back. Caiaphas didn't come back. Many of the bystanders didn't come back. A wicked soldier came back named Longinus. He came back because he was angry. Just like St. Henry Walpole. Why do you say his name? It's him, right? It's Henry Walpole. He came back just like Longinus. He went there to see Edmund Campion die. He went there to see him bleed. He went there filled with hate. Because he had something in his heart more than just an average man. And the blood of Edmund Campion dropped upon him and he converted and became a Jesuit and became a saint and himself was hung, drawn, and quartered and followed Edmund Campion. So likewise Longinus. Longinus went there Though Christ was dead, he had to pierce his side. He revisited the cross with hate in his heart. He revisited with hate. And what happened? He became a saint anyway. And Mary Magdalene revisited with sorrow and not believing that Christ could have ever risen. And she found him as a gardener. And St. Peter revisited the cross, not knowing what he was going to find. And there he found Christ. And St. John revisited, and there he found the shroud folded. And there he found the signs of the resurrection of Christ, and he believed without necessarily seeing. All those that revisited became saints. Even if they revisited like Saul of Tarsus, 
we must revisit the cross. Revisit, 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 revisit. Right now what our Lord Jesus Christ wants in His church is saints. He wants souls that have devotion in their hearts. Souls with fire. He wants souls that are going to be filled by the Caritas Christi, the charity of Christ, which urges and pushes us on. That's what He wants. And the trouble we have today is that there are almost no such hearts. But we need them. What was in the heart of David? He heard the stories of Ruth. He heard the stories of Rahab. He knew about the great women of the Old Testament before him. He knew about the great battles. He sang about them in his songs. He watched the sheep. He was filled with fire. He knew how to be a shepherd. He knew how to handle polished stones. And then one day he was given a test. Go meet Goliath. And he met him. He defeated him. And he destroyed him. And the people wisely sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. And right now we need souls that are not going to kill thousands, but tens of thousands. We need saints of our times. We need vocations. We need families that are going to devote themselves to spreading the kingdom of Christ. We need hearts that are ready to go and die for him. Hearts ready to go and spread, his, spread the devotion to God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. Hearts that are not attached to little prayers but attached to the cross and attached to Christ. And they're ready to stay wherever He is and go wherever He goes. And they won't walk away and they won't run and they won't be Judases and they won't be cowards. They'll just stay wherever He is. And this fidelity will make saints. That's the devotion that God wants inside of this enthronement of the Sacred Heart. To consecrate the daily life to our Lord. Consecrate the family to our Lord. But in such a way that the heart can never leave Christ and wants to carry him wherever we go. So thank God bless you all and the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost.